Hola. My name is Maria Montes, and I'm incredibly generous and honored to have been invited to speak at the design conference here in Brisbane. This is the city where I spent my first three years in Australia, and I cannot believe that after 11, I'm now on this stage. <laughs> Matt told me that you guys are going to vote on today's talks, which is exactly what you want to hear before going on a stage, you know? Not a biggie. <laughs> so, I've decided to talk my, to call my talk, what a shit show. <laughs> so I can release pressure on myself. My talk is surrounded by beautiful rotten tomatoes and I have rated myself one star. So now, I can leave all my expectations out of the door and be myself with all of you this morning. <laughs> the title, What I Should Show, also points out three aspects I'm going to elaborate during the next 35 minutes. The first one is self-confidence and what it's called, Stop Feeding the Beast. The second one is my shit series and the use of language as cultural identity. And the third one is my next solo exhibition in Spain, also called What a Shit Show. <laughs> As a disclaimer, I might say that there is going to be a lot of explicit language throughout my talk and in my background slides, and I will explain why later. Now, this talk is a tribute to the people who helped me in my first stage as a designer. So, let's do this. I was born in Blanes, a small town 70 kilometers north of Barcelona. My parents are not designers. They don't have a uni degree and have never been interested in traveling out of Spain. My mother was born in a remote village of only 200 people, five kilometers from the Portuguese border. We used to go to Galicia every year and I loved it with all my heart. At home, I spoke Castilian Spanish with my parents. At school, I spoke Catalan. And in my summer holidays in Galicia, I wanted to speak Galego, as I fully understood the language. In Galicia, I was the Catalan kid. And in Catalonia, I felt I was the Galician one, because everyone told me my accent was a weird mix. <laughs> well, things haven't changed that much. My accent is still today strong. <laughs> my dentist in Barcelona calls me the Australian, and my GP in Melbourne calls me the Spaniard. <laughs> my father is the second of six siblings raised in an immigrant family who traveled from the south of Spain to Catalonia looking for work. My grandparents have very limited resources and decided to offer the elder kid the opportunity of going to high school follow by university. My uncle wasn't interested in the offer and declined it. So my father put his hands up as he really wanted to study and became a draft man. My grandparents didn't let my father study because the offer was only given to the elder son. My father always told me that he had been denied the luxury of education and he will always make sure that we have access to it. I studied a Bachelor of Arts in Graphic Design. Being admitted at a private university gave me the opportunity of being in an environment I had never been in touch. I met a lot of students that came from wealthy families. Some of them highly educated, some of them highly arrogant, <laughs> and some of them extremely life experience. In my first year at uni, I met a girl who rocked my entire world. She was only 18 years old, but spoke several languages, had traveled around the world, and was in a long-distance relationship with a guy from New York City. <laughs> Her life seemed like a movie to me. <laughs> we connected instantly and became best friends. I helped her to translate the content of our classes from Catalan to Spanish, and she opened the entire world to me. After our first year studying together, she decided to move to Paris, and Geraldine kept study at Parsons School of Design, followed by her last year at Parsons, New York City. 
She became my biggest inspiration and for many, many years, most of my decisions were influenced by trying to get closer to her lifestyle. Six months before graduating from my design degree, one of my teachers offered me a junior graphic design position. This gave me the opportunity of saving, mom, saving up money for my first trip out of Spain. <laughs> Eleven months later, I was landing in New York City to spend four weeks at my friend's apartment in Brooklyn Heights. New York was love at first sight. It was everything I had imagined and more, but I could not speak English and I felt I wasn't ready for it. By the time I left New York, only a few days before 9-11, my friend uh, Geraldine was starting an internship with Milton Glaser, and I felt the most privileged person for being her friend. Back in Barcelona, I started to dream about living overseas and working as a graphic designer. <laughs> By that time, I had discovered the work of the Dutch studio called Lava. One of Lava's creative directors was a Spanish designer called Luis Mendo. I emailed Luis and he let me know that there was no positions available, but he was happy to allocate time to meet me. So, in 2003, I designed my first English business cards and I flew to Amsterdam to meet Luis and leave my folio at other design studios. Luis was incredibly generous with me. We conducted a non-official interview in Spanish where he asked me, do you speak English? <laughs> and I said, si, si, English, si, but not Dutch. <clears throat> <laughs> <laughs> then he asked me, why should I hire you? What can you offer me that no one else can? What makes you unique and different from anyone else? I was 25 years old and I froze. I recently heard a podcast called Debbie Millman and the questions you need to ask yourself and it reminded me very much that chat I had with Luis back in 2003. Meeting Luis was a milestone experience and it was my first baby step toward much bigger challenges. A few months after my experience in Amsterdam, my grandfather passed away and my father told me that he had left some money for me but he would only give me the money if it was going to be invested in education. I debated myself between studying English overseas or upskilling my web design knowledge, and in the end, I decided to enroll for a master's degree in user interface design. I remember applying to the program a few days after the course had started, so I thought I had absolutely no chances to get in, but the director of the course got in touch straight away and scheduled an interview. I remember talking to her about the program and asking, how many students are in class? And she said, 11 plus you. So I, I answered, you mean 12? And she said, no, 11 plus you. The next day I went to class to discover that we were 11 boys and I. <laughs> I had been admitted straight away into the program based on the fact that I was a girl and they needed it or they wanted it, at least one. <laughs> Half of the students in the program were from other countries, and some classes were conducted in English, and I could not follow at all. Soon after I finished my master's degree, I realized that this was my second time exposed to many, many nationalities, and the third reminder that learning English was a must. Well, right after I finished my master's, I was interviewed by a tech company who were looking for designers to become part of a very cool interdisciplinary studio. I passed successfully my first two interviews, and the third and last one was conducted in English. And guess what? I did not get it, obviously. <laughs> so, after 29 years, I finally found the courage to pack my bag and book one-way ticket overseas. I landed in Brisbane in September 2006, and a few weeks later, I moved to a shared house in West End with three Aussie guys. <laughs> I could not understand half of what they were telling me, such as, have you seen my sunnies? <laughs> I always thought they were asking me to go and watch the sunset. <laughs> Once they took 
mi camping. Uh, <laughs> I learned how to cook as um, I had heaps of time on my own. Sometimes I cooked for all of us, and they would say shit like, you should sell this, darling. <laughs> Once they took me camping, now, and they told me, how is the serenity? And they all laughed really hard. <laughs> And I'm like, I totally don't get the Australian humor. <laughs> a year later, when my English was heaps better, we all sat down one night on the couch together and they screamed the castle for me. <laughs> I laughed all 85 minutes of that movie and at the end of it, they told me, now you are one of us. <laughs> Most of us live in a constant tension between being unique and wanting to belong. In the creative industries, the line between belonging and competing against each other is very fine. In my experience, having people around you that respect, support your work, and understand the mindset of a designer is very, very important. This is my studio, Rotson, and this is my tribe, <laughs> which they don't look that different from the movie, by the way. <laughs> being surrounded by people who inspire your work and being able to collaborate with them is one of the greatest advantages of our industry, so please take it. Be generous, share your knowledge, connect, collaborate, and support the shit out of each other. <laughs> My time in Brisbane wasn't easy. I felt lost, and I wasn't proud of my work at all. I considered stop being a designer many, many times, but not knowing what to do instead, I focused on my next dream life goal, traveling. After all, now I could speak English, so there was nothing stopping me, except the bacon. <laughs> my social life in Brisbane was not, like, amazing. <laughs> So, at least it gave me the opportunity of saving a lot of money. I worked out how much money would I need for a 12-month sabbatical. Divided by the amount of money I could save up every month. Giving me, as a result, the amount of months I needed to keep working till reaching my target. Ten months and $20,000 later, I was booking flights to more than 13 countries around the world with the intention of not doing absolutely any design work right up to the end. My original plan was ending my sabbatical in New York City to test the waters and see if I still felt like pursuing my design career. To do so, I sent different emails to studios in the city, showing them my folio and offering a free four-week internship. It had only taken me eight years to face New York City again. This time, I had the language, but I did not have the vision. I got a few replies from my emails. One of them from a small design studio telling me that Stefan was currently on a sabbatical in Bali and that they were not looking for an intern, but for a graphic designer who could assist them for a longer period of time. I was not ready for that answer, so I freaked out and never follow up that email. Yeah. <laughs> That's true. That's so much it is. Um, my career crisis lasted nearly two years. I knew my graphic design work was okay, but definitely wasn't exceptional. I was sick of designing business cards and stationary design, and I could not imagine doing it any longer. So in the end, I decided to go back to study and look for a specialization. In 2011, I went back to Barcelona to study a postgrad in advanced typography, followed by a condensed program in typeface design at the Cooper Union, again in New York City. I feel like these two courses brought me back all my passion for design and for all sorts of letter forms, from calligraphy to lettering to typeface design. I feel like my decision of going back to study actually saved my design career. 
From 2011 to 2013, I worked closely with a fashion designer friend of mine, designing textiles for international fashion houses, such as Zara, Mango, Massimo Dutti, Uterque, among others. During these two years, we designed 432 prints, some of them quite simple and others not so much. This project introduced me to the world of textile design for the first time, adding a great new passion into my creative practice. Also, this project introduced me to being self-taught for the very first time, as everything I know today about textiles, I've learned it on my own, from my bedroom, with the help of YouTube and Google. So I really recommend this experience as well. <laughs> In 2014, I started my solo freelance career designing textiles for Australian fashion houses as well as independent labels. The images I'm going to show you now have been chosen by the level of creativity and especially the strong concepts behind each collection. This client is called Chorus. Chorus and I have collaborated in three occasions. I'm personally very interested in the intersection between fashion and art, and I consider Coral's work the expression of just that. I feel that in each of our collaborations, there is a lot of respect, trust, and a strong driven ideas behind the collections. That's why, in my opinion, the results are so interesting. This collection is called Hashtag, and is inspired by the selfie culture and the trends of the shot of the day where the head of the model has been cut. This one is called FOMO. And as you all know, FOMO stands out for fear of missing out, a very contemporary concept based on our hectic lifestyle. This collection explores an Australiana print, but this time made out of contemporary urban iconography, such as the famous avocado on toast, <laughs> and a new form of Australian flora which is the coffee flowers. <laughs> At the end of 2014, I was offered a textile design teaching position, and on the same year, I started to teach calligraphy from my studio in Melbourne. For my surprise, being a teacher has been the best way for me to keep learning, and also has made me a better student, as I'm not afraid anymore about asking a million questions. On the same year, also in 2014, I decided to mix my illustrative work with letter forms for the first time. And this is when my first illustrated cocktail artwork was born. In this first artwork, I decided to mix my passion for tomatoes, which is huge actually, <laughs> with my passion for surface patterns, and my brand new passion back in 2014 with lettering. The first piece of this illustrated cocktail artwork is called Bloody Maria, and it was followed by a second piece called Gin Tonic. This piece is my personal love story with the city of Barcelona, as gin and tonics have been the dream by excellence in recent years. These two artworks grab quite a bit of attention and in 2015, a cocktail venue in Melbourne offered me to host my first solo exhibition. What you see now are two color adaptations of my full color artworks, uh, letter press printed. And these ones are two images from my opening night called Breaking the Ice. A few months after my solo exhibition, I started a new personal project called The Sheet Series. <laughs> The sheet series was kick-started by my fascination with language and the colloquial ways Aussies use the word sheet. <laughs> this project has grown through organic collaboration, designing a post whenever I feel like it, and using calligraphy, lettering, or typography randomly. Some of you might be familiar with this project, but this time I'm going to go just a little bit deeper. What I'm going to show you now it's going to look like a joke, but I promise I'm not taking the piece. <laughs> <laughs> the inspiration behind my sheet series is actually my Catalan Christmas celebrations. In Catalonia, in Christmas, we celebrate something called the Cagatio, 
which is a Christmas log <laughs> standing on wooden stick legs, shitting Christmas presents. <laughs> the cagatillo has a very happy face and wears a red barretina hat and it has a blanket to keep it warm. <laughs> the kids believe that the better they take care of the tío, the bigger the presents will be. <laughs> they start feeding, uh, feeding it on the 8th of December all the way till Christmas Eve. And on Christmas Eve, the kids sing the tío song while whipping the log with a stick. <laughs> the song ends with Caga, tío which is a comment for the log to shit presents. <laughs> now, in Catalonia, we also celebrate something called the cagané. A cagané is a small figurine of a person squatting down with lower pants, shitting. Some say this figurine was very popular amongst farmers, that they believe that the cagané's offerings will make the soil rich and productive for the year coming. We believe that the Kagane represents the equality of all people because everyone pours. And it might reinforce the idea that baby Jesus is actually God in human form. And that is why the original Kagane is part of our Christmas nativity scene. Now, as you can see on the right hand side, there is a few iterations, modern iterations. And by now, the Kagane is so popular around the world that you can find absolutely any celebrity represented. <laughs> Based on the fact that my dad would call me cute nicknames such as the Shita or the Pisa when I was a little kid, I guess this series were just meant to happen for me. My shit series have taught me a lot of Australian slang. And up to today, I have designed 98 posts, and I'm planning probably to finish at 100. Now, releasing a font commercially has been on my to-do list since I first studied typeface design. As I have mentioned before, in 2015, I designed a cocktail series of illustrated artworks, including a French one called Absinthe. The lettering of Absinthe got stuck on my mind. And a year later, I decided to open Illustrator and draw the rest of the 26 letters of the uppercase alphabet. I started 2017 having my two calligraphy courses sold out, which gave me the amazing opportunity of devoting myself to this project for nine months straight. My baby is called Green Fairy, and is a chromatic, highly ornamented font for display purposes. Green Fairy has four chromatic whites, the outline, the dots, the stencil, and the full. And the outline works as a basal structure for all the other whites stuck. You can apply different styles as well as different colors to obtain multiple type styles. Green Fairy has also three combined whites called combos for these occasions where you only want to use one single color in your font. This project has been the toughest thing I have worked probably in my career. It has tested my patience and determination and I have been on the edge of quitting multiple times. But as I promised to some of you a few months ago, I wasn't gonna give up. I talked to my parents recently about this project and I knew they would not understand the tasks involved. So I told them that I was publishing a book. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so that they could understand the magnitude of the project. Last year I decided to publish commercially my font and I was very naive about the whole process and I'm going to share it with all of you. Last year in September, I submitted my phone files to a phone distributor and I stated on my email, I'm giving a talk in four weeks time and I would like to know whether you're interested in publishing my phone or not before my talk. Is it possible? And the answer came back to me pretty quickly. <laughs> Sorry, Maria, we are not going to be able to give you an answer within four weeks. In fact, the regular time frame for an answer is going to be longer than normal. So expect delays. Nine weeks 
after my submission date, I got an, I got an update from the font distributor telling me that now the answer was coming by the end of January. Now, at this point, I understood that this wasn't going to be like publishing a book, which I have never done anyway, but this was more going to be like applying for an Australian visa and getting granted, <laughs> which I have done four times, and I know very much how it is. Now, November was a very tough month for me, as I lost faith on this project and all my hopes on getting an answer by the end of the year. At this point, actually, the hardest part in my mind was dealing with the internal dialogue with myself. Listening to my inner voice telling me that it was too hard, that I wouldn't be able to make it, and that it was a total waste of time. This time, I pushed through and stopped feeding the beast, but it is not always like that. By the end of Feb, six months after my submission date, they said, yes. <laughs> I have been granted as a new font foundry called Maria Montes. In March, I signed the contract. In April, I submitted all my font files, marketing material, and type specimen. And this week, guys, my font is out in the wild. <laughs> a lot to me, no one knows. That's the first time I said it, so it feels good. <laughs> so, for the ones in this room not familiarized with typeface design, it is extremely time-consuming and it requires a lot of hard work and determination, and Chris probably will tell more about this later. Now, I have on my desk this artwork from my very good friend Magda Kaziak, and I stare at this artwork every morning because it reminds me that good shit takes time. My font would probably, but would have never happened probably with the extra push of this amazing woman. In 2016, I was invited to be part of Alphabets, an international and supportive community of women kicking us in the type design world. Being part of Alphabets has been an amazing experience for me. Listening to female voices in, doing, in the industry is very important because they encourage my work and help me to build my confidence. Here in Australia, I also have a small but supportive typeface design community. These friends of mine have all or some release fonts commercially or currently are developing typefaces. And they somehow in the last seven years have helped me in one way or another. Now, as you can see, we have again six of them and myself. <laughs> it seems to be a recurring theme in my journey. Now, I want to ask you if there is anyone in this room that knows any other Australian woman who's released a commercial font or who's currently working on developing typefaces, please get in touch with me because I would love to know more about them because I haven't found any yet. Now, this font has brought me, has led me to a really good experience and opportunity. Last year, the Art Centre La Panera in Spain offered me to host a retrospective solo exhibition. Now, following my fascination with language and colloquialisms, I have decided to marry my sheet series with my Catalan eschatological background. <laughs> if you're not familiarized with eschatology, that's pretty much what it is. <laughs> Along the four walls of the amazing space I have been given, I have decided to feature the art of eating, drinking, peeing, and pooing <laughs> as four elements part of a natural cycle in relationship and respect towards the land. Sadly, most of you are not going to be able to make it to my exhibition in Spain in three weeks' time. <laughs> So I have decided to give you a sneak peek of the exhibition. The images I'm showing you now haven't been released anywhere, same as my phone, so you're the first ones. <laughs> now, following my fascination with colloquialisms, I have decided to create a collection of 21 posters, this time using Catalan popular saints, 
and my grain fairy Fontinius. Starting with the theme of pin, this poster is called Pisha Pins, which means pine pizza. In Australia, it would be something like the person who pees on gum trees, <laughs> which is referring to a sick city slicker in the country. <laughs> Following the theme of eating, this poster means who eats hours, sheets, clocks. <laughs> Following the theme of drinking, I'm going to present you with a range of wines, liquors, and non-alcoholic beverages using my font in news. The first one is my range of white, red, and rosé wines, and they have been named after their native grapes. Now I'm going to present you my range of liquors, starting with letter A for Aujardente, which is something very traditional in Galicia, and is made out of the distillation of grapes, in a way very similar to an Italian grappa. With letter R, traditionally from Catalonia, is called ratafia, which means walnut liquor. With letter C, we have coffee liquor. And with letter S, we have sangria, which you all know what it is. <laughs> now I'm presenting you my range of non-alcoholic beverages, starting with my extra virgin olive oil, which is huge here. <laughs> and something very traditional in Catalonia as well, which is drinking sparkling water. Now, the use of language as cultural identity. My auntie told me that when I was a kid and my grandma was around, I was very naughty because I knew I could get anything from her. Now, when my grandmother wasn't around, things were not as easy. If I was complaining about buying lollies a million times a day or being thirsty or being hungry, my parents would say something like that. Si tens gana, menjet una cama, which means if you're hungry, eat your leg. <laughs> on the same humorous style, they would say, if you're thirsty, pee on the table and drink it like a water fountain. <laughs> now, following the theme of drinking, I'm going to present you two new artworks specifically designed for this exhibition that are very much traditional from me, my area. The first one is vermut. Traditionally in Catalonia, vermouths were meant to open the appetite before a big meal. I grew up having vermouths every Sunday before lunch. Most vermouths have a sweet taste, so we combine them with salty snacks to balance the palate. Like in this case, on my artwork, I'm sort of designing my ultimate tapa, which is my vermouth olives and clams that I adore. Now the message of this piece focuses all the attention in the fact that you can drink vermouth at any time of the day, and not only as an aperitif like originally. My second new artwork for the exhibition is called Chin Chin. Cava is a sparkling wine from Spain using native grapes. Inspired by the font poster by Inigo Jerez, I drew the words Chin Chin and a condensed version of the word Cava. While doing research for this artwork, I found a popular sentence by Coco Chanel that says, I only drink champagne in two occasions when I'm in love and when I'm not. <laughs> so I decided to do my own adaptation on this artwork. This exhibition means a lot to me because it's giving me the opportunity of sharing my work with my family for the very first time. Now, I cannot give you more sneak peeks of the exhibition, and I'm going to wrap up my talk now, saying that my last six months have been pretty stressful, as I have been working on my solo exhibition as well as finalizing my font, as well as getting ready for today's talk. So not much fresh air has come into my bubble. And I'm sure some of you can relate to this feeling very well. I find that our day a day sometimes is very hard because we cannot see the progression of our career, only taking care of the small battles that come to our inbox. As humans, we move fast and adjust quickly, and then we tend to forget how things were a few years or even a few months ago. I tend to forget that I can live, work, and now vote in this country. <laughs> I take for granted that I speak three languages and understand a fourth one. Oh. 
And I also take for granted that you and I are privileged people because we do what we love for a living. With this talk, I wanted to show you that isolating my work does not define me, but my whole journey does. My past, my present, my family, my environment, and especially my choices. The whole lot. Find what makes you unique. Embrace what makes us different. And celebrate what makes us alike. Thank you very much, Brisbane.